Today on Dead Dodge Garage, did you know 833s are heavy? Jesus. Also, how to rebuild the Mopar A833 4 speed. This is the Chrysler A833 Iron Case, one-to-one -one final drive, four-speed manual transmission, as used in many classic Chrysler muscle cars. Cars like this, Murray's original 344 speed 71 Cuda, which I really like. A note on this car before we move on. In the original video, I stated that this car was from the Midwest and it had a bunch of rust repair done. That was not correct. That was actually Murray's other Cuda. Uh, we were confused. This is an original California car, documented. And that's why it's got perfect original floors. Mm-hmm. Also note here, Evan's currently doing a bottom end reseal, as well as the water pump and timing cover. The 833 was first found in 1964 models. It was used essentially in this configuration into the mid-1980s. While later models featured aluminum cases and overdrive gears, this thing is all iron. So yeah, heavy. As you can see, this particular unit leaks from everywhere. So today we're going to go through this thing and figure out how to rebuild it. First, a note. I've never done this before. I've done plenty of small operations on four speeds, but I've never done an actual teardown, rebuild, reassembly. So it's a bit of a learning process for me. Luckily, I have a factory manual and Jamie Passon's book on doing this operation. I also watch some videos, so I guess I'm YouTube certified. Before we dive in, let's cover some of the basic components. Starting at the front here, the input shaft. This rides in the input shaft bearing in the back of the crankshaft. These splines, of course, that's what your clutch disc rides on. This is what your throwout bearing rides on. And this is called the input bearing retainer. It's a plate secured with four bolts that matches an inside diameter on your bell housing. Important point if you're putting together a four-speed car, you kind of need to make sure those two things match. Behind the input bearing retainer, of course, the input bearing, but also a front seal, which we can pretty plainly see on this unit is leaking. Here we have the shift housing, or as we usually call it, the side cover. This is the one, two shift. This is the three, four in the front. Reverse is down here. All 833s have a reverse light switch here. This one actually has a second switch here, which is an emission switch of some type that's only activated in fourth gear. I'm not exactly sure what it does. I suspect it's something to do with EGR. There was no wire connected to it on this car. Moving rearward, we have the tail housing or extension housing. This is where the shifter mounts in this position on an E-body like this Cuda and in this position on a B-body like a charger. Also note, the speedometer drive is right here. On the top of the extension housing, there's a breather. And at the back, where the fluid's dribbling out, the rear seal and the output shaft. This, of course, is where the drive shaft goes. The drain plug is here. The fill plug is in the middle on the other side. This two bolt mounting pad is similar on all 833s. This main body is also essentially the same for all 833s. In fact, even the GM version, that's right, there's a version of this in GM trucks, uses the same basic main body, although the input's different. I think this flange is different. Nah, that's not the point. Very similar. Here in the extension housing is where you'll really find differences. Earlier B-body units don't have this, they just have this. A-body units have a pad here, I think it's angled slightly, and the housing's shorter. There may well be other variations as well. Vans use this same configuration on the overdrive case, but these holes aren't tapped, just these ones. I might have that backwards. That's not important. Now, another note here. There are variations in these side cases. This one I believe is the, hmm, I think it's the later style with the crossbars. The earlier style has ball detents in there on a rooster comb kind of setup. The procedure is basically the same. They're essentially interchangeable. There are other differences here, but you know, all the basics are gonna be universal to any 833. If you want all of the detail on the various types of 833, different components, factory markings, I mean, the types of bolts that are used, this book by Jamie Passon of Passon Performance, really, really good. So I'd check it out. Here's a rebuild kit with synchronizers that we bought from Brewers. Brewers is the best. If you need four speed stuff, call these guys. We also have a counter shaft, just in case. I've got a small collection of drifts and hammers, and I'm probably gonna need all of those. 
I've also got a big set of snap ring pliers. Naturally, we'll need a standard set of tools here. Metal 3 8 impact and ratchet. Nice shallow and deep socket set, wrenches, all that sort of thing. Okay, time to dive in. First things first, I'm gonna pull the speedometer drive and then the shift assembly. The speedometer drive is held in with one half inch bolt. Note there is a particular direction it needs to face based on how many teeth you've got. Oh, why would you do that? Yellow, 33 teeth. Before pulling the shift assembly, I've got to take some reference pictures. I need to make sure these clips go back where they belong. The shift assembly bolts also have been. Note, these are special bolts with a machine shoulder that locates this shift assembly. You can't use just random bolts. Also note, there are a couple different lengths. Want to mix those up. Good blow, soft hammer. There we go. We'll lift this out. Highly likely the shift bolts will stay behind. Yep, there they are. Yeah, this is the later style crossbar shift assembly. The earlier style, again, had detent balls here and little rooster comb things. The old time wisdom is that the earlier style with the detent balls is better for racing. I'm not sure, I've never done side-by-side -side comparisons. You can see here the shift forks engaged in the synchro collars. Here's the three, four one. It's mostly shaped like a C. And here's one, two. Kind of looks like a, well, also a C, I guess. Tell you what, it does smell like nice, fresh, dead dinosaur juice in here. You'll want to inspect these shift forks pretty closely. As I understand, it's possible for them to crack, which can cause all kinds of weird problems. One other note on these forks, Earlier ones were brass, these are steel. Oh, here's a nice view of the different style shift assemblies in the pass-on book. Very nice. I'm gonna take the IBR off next. Too easy. You can see a crumbling paper flat gasket there. And there's the seal. It's actually still squishy. Interesting. Doesn't look too bad. It's definitely leaking. Our next operation is going to be to pull the tail housing, which brings with it the main gear assembly. To do this, the service manual suggests sliding both shift collars forward slightly and moving the reverse idler gear here into the middle of its travel. Something like that. Time to unbolt the extension housing. These are the first bolts that have been a different size. They're five eighths. Well, that one's tight. Wow. I didn't even have to hit it. It just separated. Instructions say to hit the extension housing with a hammer, but apparently it just comes out sometimes. Oh, must be hanging up on the reverse. Yep. Oh, wow. All right. There we go. Forward synchronizer's just falling out. Actually, it looks pretty good. Oh, yeah, it's as heavy as it looks. The gasket tore me. Luckily, we do have a new one. That's a little extra metal among friends. Naturally, the front roller bearing fell apart immediately. This is the way of things. The factory service manual gives the procedure for checking the end play on the countershaft gears. So I've done that. 20 thousandths. Perfect. Easy. Snap ring. Driving the counter shaft out gently toward the rear. Yeah, this is just like cleaning up. Probably. 
Yeah. Input. Note to remove the input shaft and gear, you have to knock the counter shaft through and drop the counter shaft gears down, but leave them in the case. Now that the input's out, I'll lift them up and take them out. Move the reverse out of the way. Carefully get this assembly and then bring it out, leaving rollers behind like confetti. Now that I've let all the roller bearing confetti out, we can get a good look at how the most annoying part of this is put together. This is the assembly that goes inside of the counter shaft. Although I'd heard it described and, well, seen a detailed diagram of it, it made a lot more sense once I saw it in person. These are four roller bearing assemblies. The problem is, they're not the sort of assembly that has an outer race, so you just pop them on there. You have to build them yourself. These are the little rollers. There's one there, one there, one there, and one there. These washers go between the two, and there's another washer at the end, and then you have your thrust surface. Also note this tiny half moon woodruff key. That actually keys this shaft to the case, right there. The transmission is now mostly disassembled. The only thing that's left in here, the reverse idler and the shaft it rides on. There's also a detent ball in here. I'm gonna remove all that stuff and take this case over to the dunk tank. Well, that's pretty cool. The previous installer of the reverse light switch kind of goobered the seal. Time to remove the reverse detent I'll take the cap out with the 13 16 socket, holding the body with an inch and an eighth wrench. Then I'll pull the body out, and there will definitely be a detent ball and a spring sitting in the bottom of the transmission. Mm. Magnet. Yeah, that little fella. There we go. Okay, now it's time to remove the reverse shaft with the reverse idler gear on it. Now, first I tried removing this with a drift and a hammer, like the guide video I watched. Um, that didn't work. So I came back to the manual over here and found out there's actually a special tool to do this. Shocking. Here at Rocket Restorations, we hoard all kinds of cool stuff. One of the coolest things, factory tools. These are kits of factory spec tools sold to dealerships. They were issued yearly to make sure that they'd be ready for that year's new models. We also have a huge collection of specialty tools collected from various dealers across the country. So needless to say, chances were pretty good that what I needed was in here someplace. And here it is. It's actually a seal remover for a power steering pump, but they explain here, you turn it around backwards, put a 716 socket on the head and turn it backwards and it will push that shaft out. I also found the counter shaft tool, which is awesome. Um, I needed that a minute ago. More on that in a second here. So I've actually found a whole collection of counter shaft tools and these seal drivers, which is neat. We're gonna put together a little collection of four speed stuff for doing this more in the future. If you aren't a vintage Mopar tool hoarder, this can be made out of a broom handle. And this, well, you got some options. In the book, Pass On Performance says you can use a large C-clamp and a chunk of pipe. So again, eh, you can figure this out one way or another. Maybe the drift option will work for you too. Here's what this setup looks like. You know, you probably could just make something that looks like this too. Maybe a nut over here and a socket and a bolt and yeah, anyway. After quite a bit of annoying science and dirty words, I think I got it going. Yeah. Now sure, I slightly destroyed the factory tool, but that's fine. There you go. Slowly coming up. Just a bit of a pain. Yeah, I think that was the worst part of this whole operation. Certainly wasn't as painfully easy as it was in the video I watched. Okay. And there's the reverse shift fork removed. Yeah. Actually, that o-ring is kind of squishy, but I'm gonna replace it anyway. It looked like it leaked. It could have been coming from somewhere else, but hey, we're here. Before I break down this mess of gears here, I thought I'd take this unique opportunity to show how this stuff works. The 833 is what's called a constant mesh transmission. With the counter shaft cluster here in place, you can see what that means. First gear, second gear, and third gear 
are always in contact. What changes is which one's putting power through. We'll ignore direct drive for a minute here. Here's the gear for first. Notice it spins freely on the main shaft. Second, third, same thing. What engages them is the sliding collar. This piece here, the synchronizer clutch assembly, is fixed to the shaft. So when it engages to one of these gears, it's fixed too. There's first and there's second. The input shaft and the counter shaft gear cluster mesh like this. That gear is fixed as well as all of the counter shaft gears, which means anytime the engine's running and the clutch is out, well, these two things are spinning together. Notice that means the counter shaft spins backwards. The counter shaft's being driven backwards, but then it's driving those gears forwards. So all is well. And here's what it looks like all together. Obviously, because it's sitting on the table, it's kind of hard to spin, but it is in neutral. So the counter shaft should be able to spin, but not actually put power through the main shaft. Here we go. I rigged up a working visual display using some hammer handles and a seal installer. As you can see here, the counter shaft lives down here. And when you spin the input shaft, the counter shaft spins the other way. It's meshed with all of these gears, but it's not actually driving the output shaft at all. I could grab this, spin this, and you can see it's not moving. It's just a little bit of gear drag. First gear is here. Now, as we spin this, we can see the gear reduction that is spinning at a different speed than everything next to it. We're in first gear. You can engage second gear. It'll do the same thing, but at a slightly different speed because it's now being driven through this gear. Third gear is here. Same thing. Now we're driving the main shaft through this collar and this gear. And finally, direct drive. Direct drive is special. It just locks onto these teeth. You could actually take the counter shaft out all the way and spin it like that. The counter shaft is not used for direct drive, but it is for every other gear. That leaves one more gear, reverse. The reverse idler usually sits here, but when reverse is engaged, it slides rearward. It slides rearward. There we go. And hooks those two gears together. Now, the input shaft spins clockwise. The counter shaft spins backwards. This gear spins clockwise. And its output here spins backwards. A little tricky to do, but you can see there, the main shaft is then spinning in reverse. Notice that reverse gear is here, attached to the shift collar. That's because those are the only pieces here that are locked to the main shaft. You can spin this whole assembly. Those are the only things that won't spin. And that's all there is to it. Except not quite, because we still have to talk about synchronizers. See, in this setup, you're not really shifting gears. You're dogging into these gears one by one. The way you do that is with this shifting collar going to this smaller gear alongside. For that to work, well, you kind of need a synchronizer here in the middle. Without that, there's going to be horrible grinding stuff. The part that does all the heavy lifting in this system is this, the synchronizer lock ring. You can see with this collar removed, there's a taper there on those teeth matched on this side. These two pieces job is to mesh together quickly. When you're selecting a gear, the collar moves over to the synchronizer first. Those teeth mesh, and then this piece is forced over this. This surface is tapered. You see here, they move freely, but as they're pressed together, they lock up. In so doing, this surface slows down this piece, or vice versa, until the gears can mesh. As an engine building, as I'm doing this, I'm kind of building a map. Things are in the order they came out, the order they were removed, or the order they sit in the transmission. Starting at the front of the gear assembly, I removed the sliding collar for three and four. The little teeth, we'll look at those in a second. The first snap ring, and the forward synchronizer assembly. And now it looks like this. Next is third gear, which pops right off. 
first and second come off that way. So the next move here is to pull this main cluster and output shaft out. There's a snap ring here I'll have to hold open and I'll hit the output shaft on this end with a soft hammer. First, I gotta remove the seal. I'm using this special factory tool for this, but a hammer and a pry bar or even a seal puller probably work just fine. Snap ring, dead low, back here, and it all comes right forward. Snap ring's out of the groove now. There you go. There's the tail housing, gutted, also ready for cleaning. Here's the big snap ring that retains the rear main bearing and holds that assembly in here. And here's the output shaft. This is what your drive shaft yoke goes over. Here's the rear bearing. And there's the drive for the speedometer gear. There's one more important component in here, and that's the bushing your drive shaft yoke rides in. This one doesn't look too great, so we'll be replacing that as well. Yeah, we'd like it to look like that. Not so much like this. Ugh. Well, today is tomorrow, because when today was yesterday, I got hung up removing this rear snap ring, which is unfortunate. That's actually a selective spacer. Luckily, they did supply new ones in that seal and rebuild kit, but I'll have to go through and find the one that works with the new bearing. Apparently, these smaller ones are kind of hard to remove with this style snap ring plier, but it's what I got. Before diving into pulling that rear bearing off, I thought I'd come over here and start cleaning the main case. This is kind of neat. It's got a bunch of orange overspray on it, which I don't believe is original. I'm pretty sure that's from the later engine repaint. But look at this, under the grime and some paint here, I found factory paint markings. Now, I'm not an expert on these. I don't really know what they mean, but it's cool. I think this orange spot is factory too. It matches spray marks on a bunch of the internal pieces. I'll probably try and remove a bit more of this haze, but these transmission cases factory are bare. There shouldn't be any paint on them. You know, this isn't actually a 100% factory restoration, but we're trying to do a nice job and make this look right. So I'll get as much of that paint off as I can, and this will get coated with something. And here's how the main case turned out. Pretty good. You can still see a bit of that paint haze there, but nah, I really can't do a whole lot better and still preserve those markings. So we're going to call that good. And now I've got the tail housing going. It's getting there. An interesting thing about this transmission it was greasy, but the main thing was there's like old grease with dust stuck to it. Something like that. It, it was kind of gnarly stuff, but it's coming off. Dead Dodge Garage is sponsored today by three coffees. Three coffees. It's like a good night's rest, but way worse. Mmm. All right, back to this. This is a bearing puller. This gets installed behind that bearing. <coughs> Tightens up like so. And then the whole thing gets put in the press, and that gets pressed through the bearing. Okay, small problem. To do this, you kind of need a press with child bearing hips. Ours, the opening is only like that big. You know, the standard little Harbor Freight one. I've seen bigger ones where they have a box in the middle just for doing this sort of stuff, but we don't have that. So instead, I'm going to try a technique I saw in another video about doing this. Uh, I'm going to heat it up, and then I'm going to tighten this wedge and see if that'll pop it free. Oh, by the way, the video I'm referring to that really did help me a lot with thinking through this operation is put up by a channel called I Fix My Car Myself. All one word, no spaces. Very interesting, gentlemen. The video only has about 10,000 views, and he has under 500 subscribers. I'm thinking he deserves more. Very clever individual. Go check that out if you want some more information. Anyway, I'm going to heat this in a race here. Maybe it'll give me a nice, satisfying pop sound because I've got a little tension on it. works till you run out of taper. Uh, looks like I'm about there now. Our vice here is a little underwhelming. I'm gonna see if I can just tap this the rest of the way out. And try not to drop it on the ground, obviously.
And there we go. Lots of heat, some magic spray, some swearing, hammer beating, like a thousand times, and a Trev. With the rear main bearing out of the way, next we can pull the first gear. Pull the one, two slider and it's pieces off. And then there's another snap ring and then the one, two synchronizer comes out. A quick note on synchronizers. They look very similar, but they are different. The machine faces and the heights are not the same. There's the three, four synchronizer. You can see there on the back side how deep that is. And on one, two, it's actually flush or better. So you can't get them backwards. You can't mix them up. They'll only go together and stack in there correctly one way. The main complaint in this transmission was engaging second gear. The first thing to look at, synchronizer stop ring. You can see some evidence of wear. It's not super bad. It's rounded off some, but it's not bad. Here's a new one for comparison. Teeth are a little sharper and a little taller there. The next thing to look at would be this, the teeth on second gear that engage with that sliding collar. As you can see, they're kind of rounded off. For comparison, here's a look at third gear. Look at the teeth there. The machining is flatter and they reach up to that flat machine surface. These teeth don't. I don't think these are to the point of not being usable, but they're definitely worn. Because of the straight shot from first gear to second gear, if you're going to have anywhere in the transmission, this is probably the first place you're going to find it. Also, according to the pass on book, you can wear these teeth out if you force the transmission out of gear when you're coming to a stop without pressing the clutch. Now the interesting detail here for me is, according to the pass on book, once these teeth get worn to a certain point, your transmission can pop out of second gear. That's exactly what happens in my Demon, so I'm pretty confident when I get into that one, this is what I'm going to find, but much, much worse. These synchronizer stop rings are very interesting devices. Yes, they have the teeth that can wear out, but the other important thing is this inner surface here. That's your clutch surface. These are tapered somewhat, and they fit over this tapered collar attached to the gear. The drag in here is what matches the speeds of these components so the collar can then engage the gear. In fact, one of the important rebuild steps in the book is to clean this up with some emery cloth to cut that glaze off and rough the surface up. Give this something to grab. Now, upon inspection, the old synchronizer really doesn't look bad or worn out in that area. It looks pretty similar to the replacement. However, if I set this one on the gear, now this is really hard to show you with one hand, it does grab, but it doesn't grab hard. This one, completely different. It like locks on there. You see that? I can only barely turn it. Again, not totally shot, horrible or worn out. This new one, it's gonna grab a lot better. I started trying to clean second gear up with the file a little bit and, well, now you can really see that edge there is actually wavy around these teeth. So the metal's pretty well deformed and the angle on that just isn't very nice. Plus the file I was using, well, all five of them I tried, really wouldn't even touch this material. So I don't think I could improve it much. So I think we'll be ordering a second gear, which will take a week. That's inconvenient. Other than cleaning everything a lot for the next hundred hours, the last thing I can really do here is pop this last snap ring and remove the front bearing. I'll do this in the same way I removed the back one. Pulled another horrible, annoying snap ring, and now I've got the splitter in there again. And yeah, just tightening the taper there, it has pulled it up about an eighth of an inch, so we're getting places. And this one's a little easier. It actually fits in the vise, so that's nice. Still wouldn't fit in the press though. There we go. Note, the groove goes towards the front of the transmission for that snap ring. This is kind of neat, since I've got it in my hand. Look at the teeth on fourth gear. They're absolutely perfect because fourth really doesn't take any abuse. Neither does first generally because you're only engaging it at a stop. Second is really the only one that gets beat. So that's where you can expect to find all the problems. That's been my experience in like every 833.
second gear is where the bad stuff happens. Note here, this particular transmission uses the 307 bearing in the front and a 308 in the back. There are different combinations of these. I think this is the most common. Well, once again, through the magic that is the hoarding program we've got going on here at Rocket Restorations, I found a second gear. It appears to be brand new. It was here with a bunch of other brand new four-speed parts. Upon further inspection and some light, this is not a brand new gear. It is in much better shape than what we have, although there are a couple small chips on these teeth. I'm not sure what that's about. I dressed the few little damaged teeth with a file. They look pretty good, so I think we're gonna go with that. Time to eat a sandwich. All right. While Trev beats Tom's charger mercilessly with a hammer, I'm gonna clean four speed components. As I'm cleaning, I will be looking over all of these other components and making sure there's nothing else to worry about. Horrible dings and bearing surfaces, and that sort of thing. I'll also be looking over all the gear teeth. They look pretty good. Most stuff in this transmission does. Remove the tail shaft bushing. I removed the old one with totally the wrong tool. Then I looked in the book, got a number, went back to the Rocket Restorations, classic Chrysler tool hoarding project and found this. This ends for removing it and that ends for installing. So let's do that. Oh, I also applied grease to the bore there. Make sure when you do this, the oil hole lines up with the V groove in the case. Otherwise, you're gonna have a bad time. This new one has little notches. They go inward. Nug fit there is key. You can definitely use something else to do this, but if you're not careful, you're going to goober the end. When life gives you lemons, get a bigger hammer. Much better. Still perfectly aligned. You'll know it's there when this uh, wide edge hits the case and stops. Like that. Now this is probably overkill, but I went ahead and greased the inside bore of the bushing too. Got the IBR cleaned. I'm going to drive in the new seal, which annoyingly goes this way. So I'll probably use um, this thingy and a hammer. Prepping the input shaft now. It's been through one round of cleaning. Now I'm going to take some 180 grit emery cloth and rough this surface up a bit. Just remove the glaze from it so the synchronizer lock ring has a nice surface to dig into. Definitely don't need to go super ham on this. Just a little bit of clean. Time to press the input bearing into place. Make sure the groove is pointing up. Something like this. Wood blocks, optional. Oh, I did grease that thing as well, which is probably why it's just going right in. There we go. Pressed in place. Now I need to go through the collection of snap rings they sent with the rebuild stuff and find whichever one fits that groove the best. Now I'm not gonna film myself installing these lock rings because the amount of profanity would get me demonetized, but what worked for me was starting this end in there and then just kind of walking it around. The next part of this job is the messiest and probably the most annoying. We need to assemble the roller bearings that the counter shaft cluster rides on. To do this, I'm gonna use this arbor tool. It's just like a counter shaft, but shorter. You could also use a broom handle. That's what the guy in the video I watched did. Step one, install the center spacer on your arbor tool. Step two, install both. It's not gonna be centered yet, that's fine. Step three, locate your bag of a zillion rollers. There is a bag in this rebuild kit of only 16 rollers. That one's for the input roller. Step four, locate your four washers. The assembly process is like this. One roller bearing in, washer in. Two roller bearing in, washer in. Same on the other side. The real trick here is getting all this to hang together. I'm gonna use this red and tacky lithium-based grease. You could also use transmission assembly lube, but I couldn't get any in time. This will do the same thing. I did extensive reading on the subject. Apparently lithium-based grease will dissolve into 8090 and everything will be just fine. There's one bearing packed in there. 
In the Pass On book, they recommend setting the rollers out into packs of 19. Each one of these assemblies is 19 rollers. I just started grabbing them from the bag and, well, I got the right number. The next step here is to insert a washer, and I'm gonna use that washer to push this roller rearward onto that dummy shaft. So far, so good. Now I'll assemble the next one and do that again. Obviously, the more greasy and horrible, the better in this case. I will say I was expecting this to be a lot more annoying. But with enough grease to hold the rollers in place, that's not a problem. The key to this is having that shaft in there, the arbor tool, dummy shaft, piece of wood, pipe, whatever you got. That's gonna hold this all together as we're installing it in the transmission. Without that, these would probably just fall apart. Mmm, grease. What a delicious smell. Kind of minty, actually. You'll know you've got the right number. When you get to your last one, it'll have a little more resistance before it pops into place. They do all have to be pretty straight or, well, it won't want to do that. That one, there we go. Perfect. Okay, now the rollers are on the shaft. Now the washer. Beautiful. Pop that out this end, flip it around, and do the same thing again. And then with some more grease, you attach the spacer washers to the ends. And that's it. Counter shaft cluster assembly is ready to install. Okay, I had gotten a little excited and installed the input shaft first before the cluster. Don't do that. Try and remember the way you took it apart. Or, you know, just read the step-by-step -step instructions with pictures. Time to delicately install this assembly into the case. You have to line up these little tangs on these end bushings with the slots. the input shaft delicately and the snap ring for the front bearing should I roll on like so nice and easy and the IBR an IBR gasket which I've installed dry also make sure you got a little grease here where the input seal goes. Make sure it lines up the drain back hole with the opening in the gasket. And this weep hole here on the IBR should be pointed down. Notice this hole drilled in the IBR that points downwards? That's a weep hole. If the seal in here fails, the oil is supposed to leak back here and not run up here to your clutch. I'm sure there's a proper torque spec for these bolts, but it's not listed in the book, so I just made them nice and snug. With the input in place, I can now lift the counter shaft assembly up, mesh these gears, and then install the counter shaft from the back. You line this cluster assembly up and start installing the counter shaft from the back, and as you do, it's going to push out the arbor, or whatever tool you're using, at the front. The shaft will get to about this point and stop. Now, you're going to need to install this half moon woodruff key, probably with some grease to hold it in place. It sits in this slot and locates the shaft in the case to keep it from rotating. I'm using new keys that came with the rebuild kit. The old ones looked fine. And then you drive the shaft in with a soft hammer, making sure that that thing doesn't rotate and the key doesn't fall out. our counter shaft cluster in place. Spins great, feels excellent, no noise. Note, I did pre-oil the input bearing. There's no note of that in any of these instructions, but it seemed like the thing to do. It's now the smoothest feeling 833 input I've ever felt, so yeah. I did also get a little bit of oil on the gears there. I'm just using regular gear oil for this. Now you'll notice even with a new bearing in here, the shaft moves in this direction. That's because it needs the bushing on this end to hold it in the correct position. That bearing in there doesn't prevent this movement. A couple notes on the counter shaft before moving on. It's removed, tapping it from the front rearward, and it's installed from the rear forward. Again, 
with the half moon key locking its rotation. If you try to do it the other way, you'll ruin this bushing up here and you'll mess up your shaft and that'll all be bad. So don't. Also, I checked the end play in it as the manual instructed before removing it and it was fine at 20 thousandths, but I didn't like the grooves on this bushing, so I replaced them anyway. I keep saying bushing, that's a thrust washer. That's nah, fine. Anyway, it's 18 thousandths now. And that just means you've got that much movement side to side. That's exactly what we want. Next is time to install the reverse stuff. The idler gear, the fork, lever, the thingy there, and the shaft, of course. Now, another note here. This reverse idler gear is the only other place I've seen obvious wear. And that makes sense because this gear is non-synchronized. So every time your transmission goes chunk into gear, it's these teeth making that noise. I did clean this up a little bit with a file. It's definitely serviceable, but you can see the rounded off teeth there. First to go in is the fork. I did replace the O-ring and apply some grease here. And it's just gonna get pushed up into the case. Like so. This is the piece that actually slides the gear. And it goes into the fork from the back here. A little grease, hopefully it'll stay put for a second. And next the reverse shaft is gonna get installed from the rear just like the counter shaft. It also gets a half moon just like the counter shaft. Recall this was a very difficult removal. So I've greased the crap out of it and hopefully that helps. I'm gonna install this in the rear. Then I'm gonna start the idler gear on it with this this the ridge facing rearward and locked into that little piece on the fork just like so i do have the slot lined up that one actually kind of points upward so maybe it's easier to keep the half moon in that a little dab of grease did the trick on this one so i'm sure that will work and it's a matter of beating it into place carefully of course Absolute perfection. Time to move the main case out of the way and start working on the main gear cluster. I'm preparing to put the main gear cluster together, I'm cleaning everything from front of the transmission to back. As I move things over here, I'm also inspecting and scrutinizing. One thing I found was on this front shift collar, the 3-4 collar, there's very fine metal in there, which took quite a bit to clean. The more important subject is where it came from, and the answer is here, the synchronizer body. That wear pattern is interesting. It makes a lot of sense when you consider this is keyed to the main shaft, so all the power is being transmitted through this collar and this piece. As the two move together, they wear. I went and looked at the spare parts pile and the collar in there looked exactly the same as this, so we're just gonna have to go with this. Again, it's a bit worn, but I don't think that's a major problem at this stage. Now, as I'm doing this, I'm making sure to set the components back down the way they were. Now again, these collars are different. You really couldn't install them backwards. I mean, you could, but it would take an immense amount of talent. These only stack one way. This will stack on second gear like so. It won't stack in there backwards. So it's relatively foolproof. And of course there are diagrams to verify against, but it's just good practice. Keep everything facing this direction so you know how to put it back on. These little teeth that go inside the collar also need to be checked. They look really good. A couple teeth on third gear look not as bad as second did, but not the greatest. So that'll get a little file work too. Here's a quick look at the filing process. Again, not all of these teeth look bad, but I'll probably hit all of them anyway. It's a pretty tough material, so it takes a pretty serious business file. But I'm just knocking these little rough spots off, cleaning that up. Of course, when it's factory machine, this is a sharp point. You really don't want it rolled, but you definitely don't want those little bits on there. This is your point of engagement for the gear, so any roughness here is going to transfer to rough gear engagement. We don't want that. One could spend quite a bit of time doing this. It's like filing a chainsaw blade, but much more annoying. Obviously, as you're doing this, 
Try not to score the main gear teeth. You really can't do much here with the file. You're just cleaning it up. Turns out the best technique for this, breaking the glaze on those friction surfaces, spin it in your hand. Looks good, so I cleaned it again and now it's ready to install. I did obviously check another stop ring on there and it grabbed very well. I broke the blades on second gear and the new synchro grabs that extremely well. So that's gonna be good. There we go. Everything's nice and clean. I've got the new synchro rings over here and it's ready to reassemble. The first thing I'm gonna do is put these shift assemblies back together, which is a little tricky. You have to get the three tabs in there and sort of hold them down against the springs while you slide the collar over the top. Let's see if I can get this put together. All right. All three of the tabs. Make sure I've got the direction right. A little tricky to hold these springs together. There you go. You can put them in after the fact. A little tricky. Took a little fiddling, but there they all are around the two spring pieces. That seems to be correct. And it should. Go together on first gear like so. Put this assembly all together, you can see a quick demonstration of how the synchro stop ring works. You can see this gear is spinning nicely and smoothly. Okay, it wobbles a little, but it's not on the shaft. It's on the machine face in there, so that's spinning free. As soon as you slide this collar up, you see it begins to engage the stop ring, and all of a sudden there's resistance. The further you pull, the harder it gets. So, in one move, this starts to slide over. It pushes the stop ring up. The springs push on it. And then it's able to continue and engage the gear. And ditto the other direction. Okay, finally time to start assembling everything on the main shaft, or the output shaft. I'm going to turn it upside down, and then second gear goes on collar and synchronizer assembly, then first gear. And there's a snap ring in there somewhere. Then I'll press on the new rear bearing and install the little snap ring. I'm applying a good bit of grease to this surface here. As well as that, that's a thrust surface. And the second gear actually rides against that, so. Okay, second gear first. Carefully not messing up the teeth. And the collar assembly. If you didn't make sure it was put together correctly, but the spot for the fork goes forward. On the rear one, it goes the other direction. There we go. Okay, so that's good, but that's the fins. So we're gonna get the gear. Today I learned we actually have the right snap ring pliers for these stupid flat ones. That would have been nice to know several days ago. Anyway, time to install the snap ring on the 1-2 synchronizer clutch assembly. Very important not to overstretch this thing. Come on. There we go. Nice. I'm trying to get your gloves caught in it. That could be a problem. I removed this stop ring to install that snap ring, so we'll pop it back in now. And then, first gear. Right at the back. Again, I did grease all of those surfaces. There we go. Lines up straight there, so that seems promising. And it engages. Okay, and it's grabbing. Lovely. Just be careful not to send that too far. It kind of gets jammed up. If second and first stacked up correctly with the synchro, this should be give or take flush right here. Now I'm gonna grease these surfaces and press on the bearing. The groove on this bearing needs to face the front of the transmission, so it needs to go this way. Also, it's gonna be a little bit of a delicate operation because I gotta flip this upside down to put it in the press. Okay. Just 
holding first gear up in position and pressing this on. Synchro grabs really well. Okay. Here you go. Bearing pressed. Now it's time to install the snap ring behind the rear bearing. They do give you a couple options. Make sure you pick the one that fits the most snug. Now, let the main shaft assembly flip the other way in the vise. Time to grease these surfaces. Again, including this thrust surface here. And then install third gear. Which goes this way. synchronizer assembly. Make sure the teeth line up on the brass ring. Beautiful. Third gear. Not a third gear. Third gear synchro lock. There we go. Kind of have to make sure those teeth are sitting in there right. Now it grabs. Very nice. And then it gets another snap ring here. I really don't like these. But it's easier with the right pliers, even if they are broken a little. I've been testing these periodically to make sure they all still work. There's first gear, second gear, third gear. And of course, direct drive will be here on the input shaft. I did notice this synchro ring was dragging a little bit, but as I'm working it back and forth, it seems to be freeing. It's brand new. I'm sure it'll have to wear on some. I'm going to pre-oil this rear bearing just a little bit. Or a lot. Whichever. Lovely. Uh, on the front? The rear is well pulled. They're just aren't that I have to grab the snap ring. Turns out you gotta lift the ring up into its groove. It can sit back there behind where it's supposed to be. And there we have a main gear cluster. And a really nice sounding back bearing. Now note, this shaft also floats until your drive line's in place. That gives it the support at the back. It is also supported at the front by the roller bearing in the back of the input shaft. Speaking of which, let's pack the roller bearing in the back of the input shaft. Note at this point, the direct drive synchro ring is still not installed. That'll get put in right as we're installing this into the main case. Time to pack the roller bearing in the back of the input shaft. The process is exactly the same as the counter shaft well, it's mostly the same. The differences are there are only 16 rollers. Also, it's dark and you can't see what you're doing. One. And 16, which again, as you're dropping in there, will give you a little bit of resistance as you're aligning all of these things. They were up over the ridge in the back. There we go. Nice. All right, now it's time to install the tail housing and everything else into the case. First, I'm gonna install the direct drive synchronizer stop ring. Drop the gasket in place. Easy. Now it's time to drop the tail assembly in, for which I definitely suggest you get help. Okay. 
Or you can just get an Evan to do it, I guess. Gotta watch the reverse here. Steady. To go there, and then this will pilot and get a roller bearing. Why is it not? Uh, what are we hitting? Oh, the collar goes forward. Uh, make sure you put the rear slider rearward and the front one forward, but not too far or it falls off and then the little slider pieces fall on your roller bearing and you're going to have a bad time. Is that as easy as it looks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The problem is the front slider interferes with the counter shaft, so it doesn't just go together. All right, pipes. Okay. Up again? Yeah, just a hair. There. Okay, now over. Okay, it's under the gear. We pilot it into the roller. Gently. I wonder if it's easier to put the tail housing in and install the main case on that. Good, I'll get it. Okay, angle it. Yep. Okay. Angling. Almost fast. Angle top. Oh, that way. Okay. Um, okay, that's the collar. Out of the way. Now we gotta mesh things. Keep rotating. First went. There we go. And okay, they're all starting to mesh. It's the roller bearing now, I guess. again and try and look in there. Yep, it displaced the roller. Okay, they're all there now. What a pain. Yeah. That's why these things are expensive to have rebuilt. I guess so. That might have hurt you as much to watch as it hurt me to do. Try doing it the way they said in the book, which is you put the body in the vise and drop the tail shaft in. I just didn't want to go together that way and the synchronizer kept falling apart. Then we thought we got smart and flipped it the other way, put the tail housing in the vise and dropped the body onto it, but then the input roller kept falling apart. <sighs> then we put it on the table like this and it kind of went right together. I'll tell you right now, you want help to do this because it doesn't just pop in, you gotta navigate. And with the tail housing bolts cleaned and torqued to what spec, I don't know, they're just tight. Uh, it's time to install the shift cover and the other small pieces. Okay, the torque spec on these bolts is actually 50 foot-pounds. I dropped some gear oil on all the guts, the gears, the synchronizer stop rings, etc. That's one of the shift forks installed. Now I grabbed a yoke just to make sure everything spins nicely, fits in the bushing, as well as they ever do anyway. Now I can install the rear seal. I'm going to install the seal with this. Special factory tool. And I'm not gonna put it in crooked. All right, maybe a little. Really? I'm gonna go ahead and recommend you don't use that soft material factory tool and use a socket, because that works fine. Before the shift cover can go on, the reverse detent needs to be installed. I'm installing the holder first, which I'll then tighten down. Notice it's got a new paper gasket there as well. Then the detent ball, spring, and finally the cap will go in. The cap also gets a new seal. With the reverse detent reinstalled, you can see the action there. And I also installed the light switch. You can see here how it works. Okay, now it's time to install the shift cover. This is the crossbar interlocking design. So you have to get these up under that. I'm gonna try and install it with this one in place. You can't do that with the one two because of the shape so you gotta set this down onto it and then reach in there and pop the crossbar okay start it there should go further than that once it's centered there okay and then reach in with a screwdriver get the interlocking arm that way and it should go over the pin 
Again, had to go clean side cover bolts. Note, again, these are special. These shorter ones have shoulders. There's one longer one with the shoulder. That goes in this hole. You can see it's counter drilled down there. That locates the side cover. Now, there are two long bolts. They only have a tiny shoulder. They go in these two positions. You can always tell that because the metal is much thicker. And all the rest are the same. And then the side cover bolts get torqued to 18 foot pounds. And now this thing is together, except I need to go find a rear seal that's not ruined. Hey, what do you know? The metal one knocks it right in there. As the transmission assembly is complete, I thought I'd take a moment to mock the rods up on the bench here, check the adjustment, and show you how this all works. We've got the shift linkage all installed here. I did use a new washer and clip kit from, well, these guys, of course. The linkage was last put together with random hardware, like these little hairpins. They just don't locate these things well enough, and without the washers, they're able to move in and out. You can see now these are very tight, and that should take some slop out of the shifter. These levers on the side of the transmission match the locations of the internals, the gears. One is in the back, two is here, then three, and direct drive is in the front of the input. So, these connect to those sliding collars in there and give us the gears. Over here on the shifter end, there are three arms that connect to those runs. When the shifter is put into the one, two gate, here's what happens. One, two. Popping into the center, it automatically goes back over to the three, four gate. Three, four. This shifter is actually pretty well aligned right now. I really don't think I need to adjust it. Yeah, good side to side action. Now reverse, a little harder to do with it here on the bench, but it's all the way here. You can hear the audible noise of those gears mashing together, which you'll hear in the car too. That's it. Again, the adjustment on this one is very close, but uh, the procedure is you put something in here and that locks all these arms together. A big hex key usually works. Then you spin these until they pop into the holes perfectly and you should be good. There's just nothing like a pistol grip shifter. Hey, there we go, a completed rebuilt A833. Yeah, this thing's ready to go back in the CUDA. Maybe in about a week here, we'll be doing a test drive. And of course you'll see that too. Hopefully you learned a lot from this video. I did, like how not to rebuild an 833. Now I just have to clean all these greasy fingerprints off this thing again. If you have any questions about this, you can feel free to ask in the comments, or maybe just buy this book because it really tells you everything you need to know. I mean, there are pictures of everything. It's amazing. Thank you very much to Pass On Performance and Brewers for making this not only possible, but pretty easy. And thank you very much for watching. If you want to see more videos like this, do the subscribey thing.